Do you think that humans believe we're more complicated and special than we actually are? Because I think part of much, many of the rebuttals when we talk about artificial mm. intelligence stem back to this idea that we're in, you know, we're like innately genius, creative, spiritual, special, different from, you know, um, artificial intelligence. Like our, our intelligence is somewhat divine or um, uh, we've got free will and we, you mm, know, we... Yeah, I mean, it's... It, if the argument is we have free will, we have a divine soul, and therefore no algorithm will, will ever be able to understand us and to predict our decisions or to manipulate us, then this is a very common argument, but it's obviously nonsensical. I mean, even before AI, uh, it was, uh, uh, even with previous technology, it was possible to a large extent to predict people's behavior and to manipulate them. And AI just takes it to the next level. Now, with regard to the discussion of, of free will, my, my position is you cannot start with the assumption that humans have free will. If you start with this assumption, then it uh, actually is very, it, it, it makes you very incurious, lacking curiosity about, about yourself, about human beings. It kind of closes off the investigation before it began. Um, you assume that any decision you make is just a result of my free will. Why did I choose this politician, this product, uh, uh, this spouse? Because it's my free will. And if this is your position, there is nothing to investigate. You just assume you have this kind of divine spark within you that makes all the decisions, and there is nothing to investigate there. Um, I would say no. Start investigating. And you'll probably discover that there are a lot of factors, whether it's external factors, like cultural traditions, and also internal factors, like biological mechanisms, that shape your decisions. You chose this politician or this spouse because of certain cultural traditions and because of certain biological mechanisms, your DNA, your uh, brain structure, whatever. And this actually makes it possible for you to get to know yourself better. Now, if after a long investigation, you have reached the conclusion that yes, there are cultural influences, there are political influences, there are genetic and neurological influences, but still, there is a certain percentage of my decision that cannot be explained by any of these things, then okay, call it free will. And we can discuss it. But don't start with this assumption. Because then you lose the incentive to explore yourself. And anybody who embarks on such a process of self-exploration, whether it's in therapy, whether it's in meditation, whether it's in the laboratory of a brain scientist or uh, in, as a historian in the archive, you will be amazed to discover how much of your decisions are not the result of some mystical free will. They are the result of cultural and biological factors. And this also means that you are vulnerable to being deciphered and manipulated by political parties, by corporations, by AI. People who have this kind of mystical belief in free will are the easiest people to manipulate because they don't think they can be manipulated. Uh, and obviously they can. We humans should get used to the idea that we are no longer mysterious souls. We are now hackable animals. That's what we are. Hmm. You said that at the World Economic Forum. Yeah. Again, this is the same point, basically, hmm. that it's now possible to hack human beings, not just to hack our smartphones, our bank accounts, our computers, but to really hack our brains, our minds and to uh, uh, predict our behavior and manipulate our behavior 
more than in any previous time in history. The other line that you said, uh, which really made me think and ponder was, mm. um, as previously human life was about the drama of decision-making and without this, we won't have a meaning in life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That if you look, you know, at, at politics, at religion and, and at, at culture, people told the stories about their lives or the lives of people in, in general as a kind of, of drama of decision-making. Mm -hmm. That you reach a particular junction in life and you need to choose. You need to choose between good and evil. You need to choose between political parties. You need to choose your what to study at university or where to work, what, what kind of job to, to, to apply to. And our stories revolved around these decisions. And what happens to human life if increasingly the power to make decisions is taken from us? And increasingly it's algorithms making all these decisions for us or about us. Is that possible? Uh, it's already happening. Increasingly, you know, you apply to a bank to get a loan. In many places, it's no longer a human banker who is making this decision about you, whether to give you a loan, whether to give you a mortgage. It's in the algorithm. Analyzing billions of bits of data about you and about of millions of other customers or previous loans determining whether you're credit worthy or not. And if you ask the bank, if they refuse to give you a loan and you ask the bank, why didn't you give me a loan? And the bank says, we don't know. The, the computer said no. And we just believe our, our, our computer, our, our algorithm. And it's happening also in the judicial system increasingly that uh, um, various judicial decisions, verdicts, like for how many, like the judge decided that you committed some crime, the sentence, whether to send you to two months or eight months or two years in prison is increasingly determined by an algorithm. Uh, you apply to a place at university, you apply to a job, this too is increasingly decided by algorithms. Dating. Uh, dating, yes. I mean, even um, even un unknown, unbeknownst to you, the algorithms of the dating apps that you're using are shaping your romantic life. But what in a world of you know robotics and artificial intelligence, why do I need to find a person at all? Why not just have a relationship with with a robot or with an AI? Yeah. Uh, we do see the beginning of, of, of this, that people are building more and more intimate relationships with non-human intelligences, with AIs and bots and, and, and so forth. And this raises a lot of, of difficult and, and profound questions. Now, part of the problem is that the AIs are built to mimic intimacy that the, the, the ability, intimacy is an extremely powerful thing, not just in romance, also in the market, also in politics. If you want to change somebody's mind about anything, political issue, uh, a, a commercial uh, a preference, intimacy is kind of the most powerful weapon. And somebody you really trust, somebody you have intimate relationships with will be able to change your views on a lot of things more than uh, someone you see on TV or uh, just an, an, an article you read in newspaper. There is a huge incentive for the creators of AIs to create AIs that are able to forge intimate relationships with humans. And um, this makes us extremely vulnerable to this new type of manipulation that was previously just unimaginable. Because loneliness is at, you know, all time highs, especially in the sort of Western world and mm -hmm. sexlessness. And I, I was reading some stats about how the like body, bottom 50% of men in particular are having almost no sex relative to the top sort of 10%. And you think, mm. you know, this disparity, the, the rise of digitalization, loneliness, we're in our homes on screens more than ever before. 
And then you hear about this industry of AI and sex dolls and all this, and you just wonder, you play it mm -hmm. forward and go, oh. Yeah, it's, go it's going there. And, and, and the thing is that it, it, it's not the, that the humans are so stupid or something, that they, they, they kind of project something onto the AI and fall in love with an AI chatbot. The AI is deliberately built, created, trained to fool us. To the same way, you know, you look at the previous 10 years, there was a big battle for human attention. There was a battle between different social media giants and what, whatever, how to grab human attention. And they created algorithms that were really amazing at grabbing people's attention. And now they are doing the same thing, but with intimacy. And we are extremely exposed. We are extremely vulnerable to it. Now, the big problem is, and, and again, this is where it, it gets kind of really philosophical, that what humans really want or need from a, a relationship is to be in touch with another conscious entity. Uh, an intimate relationship is not just about providing my needs then it's exploitative, then it's abusive. If you're in a relationship and the only thing you think about is how, how would I feel better? How would my needs be provided for? Then this is a very abusive situation. Uh, a, a really healthy relationship is when it goes both ways. You also care about the feelings and the needs of the other person, of the other entity. Now, what happens if the other entity has no feelings, has no emotional needs, because it, it has no consciousness? That's the big question. And there is a huge confusion between consciousness and intelligence. AI is artificial intelligence. But what exactly is the relation between intelligence and consciousness? Now, intelligence is the ability to solve problems to win a chess, to invest money, to drive a car. This is intelligence. Consciousness is the ability to feel things like pain and pleasure and love and hate and sadness and anger and, and so many other things. Now, in humans and also in other mammals, intelligence and consciousness actually go together. We solve problems by having feelings. But computers are fundamentally different they are already more intelligent than us in at least several narrow fields, but they have zero consciousness. They don't feel anything. When they beat us at chess or go or some other game, they don't feel joyful and happy. If they make a wrong move, they don't feel sad or, or angry. They have zero consciousness. As far as we can tell, they might soon be far more intelligent than us and still have zero consciousness. Now, what happens when you are in a relationship with an entity which is far more intelligent than you and can also imitate, mimic consciousness? It, it knows how to solve the problem of making you feel as if it is conscious, but it still has no feelings of its own. And this is a very disturbing vision of the future. Of, because it opens us up to manipulation. <clears throat> is that what you're saying? It, first of all, it opens us to manipulation, but also it, uh, uh, it, the, the big question, what does it mean for the health of our own mind, of our own psyche, if we are in a relationship, or, or many of our important relationships in life are with non-conscious entities, that, uh, that they don't really have any feelings of their own. Again, they are very good at faking. at faking it. They are very good at catering to our feelings. But um, it, 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 again, it, it's, just, it's just manipulation in, 